My name is Joey Stuckey. I am the producer, engineer, and owner of Shadow Sound Studio here in Macon, Georgia. I'm really a producer, and that's kind of a confusing term. A lot of people don't know what that means, and a lot of people think they're producers and they're not. But what I do is I take charge of a project from the musical composition side, um, from the performance aspect, make sure we get good performances, and then I also take care of all the sound technical stuff. A lot of times a producer does not handle setting up the microphones and stuff like that, but I do, I do both the engineering and the producer work. Uh, and then I'm also a session musician, so I play a lot of guitar and bass and piano and stuff like that on other people's records. So I really do a lot of stuff all in one package uh, because I'm just sort of schizophrenic like that. I just, I just kind of, I just kind of do it all. So, so it, it started off with me just wanting to be like an engineer. Well, well, really, I just wanted to start off making sound effects, and then it went to me wanting to be a sound engineer, and then it went to me wanting to be a musician and a sound engineer, and then so eventually I sort of came up with this idea of a producer that allows me to sort of encompass all the things I love in one role. So that that's kind of what I've done, and I've just kept doing it and doing it to the best of my ability, and that's led some places. So that's that's made it possible to meet some amazing people. At the age of 13, I realized that I, sound was something I had an affinity for. And I um, had a very interesting sort of childhood. I was sick a lot as a result of a brain tumor, and that's the reason I'm blind. And uh, it also basically destroyed my endocrine system, for, which means that I take a lot of pills. Um, but they're all, they're all prescriptive. But, um, so I, I had a really hard time when I was about 13. I had pneumonia. Uh, for about six months, I had to be homeschooled. And um, it was a tough time, but it's when I really realized that sound is what I wanted to do. And so from that moment on, I put my mind towards being in the music business and being in the sound business. My first idea of what I wanted to do was actually I wanted to make sound effects for TV and film. Um, and do some of that, but as I got older and got introduced to music in a real serious way, I realized that music was my medium. I started toting around recording devices at a pretty young age, and everywhere I'd go, if I heard an interesting sound, I'd stop, and my parents would indulge me and let me go record it. Now, what I had at the time was a little cassette recorder. It was nothing, it was, I mean, it was totally primitive. Um, interestingly, still today, I'm the same way. And my wife is so sweet and doesn't think I'm crazy. When we stop on a street corner or we stop somewhere, and I was like, oh man, check out that sound, and I want to capture that, and I record it. Now the tools I have are much more professional. But the step that I took essentially was having never really met a stranger. Um, when I was so sick, when I was 13, I was listening to all these great NPR radio shows. And they used to do old radio dramas, like from the 40s and 50s and 60s. And, and modern radio dramas from the 70s and 80s as well. Radio dramas basically is, is the same thing as watching TV or a movie, but it's all done with sound effects, you know, dialogue and music. There's no, there's no picture, but it's the same kind of experience, especially for me. So I started listening to that and I started calling the DJ up that played this stuff on public radio. And I'll never forget him, his name's Rob Thomas. And he came over to my house and started teaching me what he knew about recording, which wasn't much but it was enough to get me started. And then I went to the local electronic stores and bought as much recording equipment as I could find, you know, that was reasonable for a 13-year-old to have. And uh, I just continued doing it when I, I lived in Florida at that time. Then I moved to Macon when I was about 15. I graduated high school when I was 14. I moved to Macon when I was 15. And then I started going to Mercer when I was 16. But that sort of year hiatus from 15 to 16, I worked at the Museum of Arts and Sciences here in town. And I was their sound technician. And I got that job because the guy I met, Rob Thomas, um, back when I was 13, 14 years old, he recommended me for the job because a friend of his was here in charge of the, of the planetarium. So I got the job doing that, and then a lot of the people that worked there were roughly my age, a little bit older, and they were all in garage bands and stuff like that. And they're like, hey, we understand you got some recording equipment. Like, absolutely. Like, can we come to your house and record? Sure. So it all started there, and, and I really, that's when the business actually took off. And then, you know, eventually I had people come to my house all the time recording, and my dad was like, you know, you should have a, a space. You should have your own space to do this. So by the time I was 19, I was in the recording business in earnest and making records for a living. One of the reasons you want to hire me is the fact that I can't see. So all I'm doing is listening. There are no, when I'm listening, that's it. There's nothing else happening in my mind. Um, I don't think my ears are magically better than your ears. I don't think there's some sort of physiological change. I think what's different is the fact that I'm processing more information because it's all I've got. 
Sight's a very powerful sense. And I, I think that you can sort of forget your other senses a little bit because sight's so powerful and people use it so much to understand the world around them. So for me, I don't have that. So I'm just processing more information a little faster, maybe a little bit more accurately because my ears are what I have to work with. Um, so I, I think that's the big difference. Find a green blanket on the beach Use the cold part of your heart To take a walk in the shadow When I moved here, I'd never heard of the Almond Brothers and, or, or any of those big southern bands um, Wet Willie, uh, Marshall Tucker, Charlie Daniels I, I had heard of But the, the, the history of great southern music that comes from this town Is really almost... Uh, incomprehensible. I mean, it's just so mind-blowing. You know, this is the home of Little Richard, the home of Otis Redding. Uh, the Almond Brothers chose to make this their home. Wet Willie chose to make this their home. In fact, my good friend is Jimmy Hall from Wet Willie. He, they, lived, they were from Alabama originally. And he said, you know, back in the 70s, they were like, okay, we've been playing a long time. If we can't make it in the next 18 months, we need to just quit and go get real jobs. And they were all 25, 26 years old. And they said, they, they said, okay, where could, where should we move our music career to? What place will help us actually have a career? Where do you think we can make it? Where do you think people will get it? And they chose to move from Alabama to make it. And the rest is history. I mean, they've had a ton of gold records. Keep on smiling's a huge song of theirs. Um, so, I mean, there's just so much, there's just music in the water, music in the air, music in, in the blood of people that are from here. And even though I'm not originally from here, I mean, I, I feel like I'm from here. And I, I was named in 2006 the official music ambassador for, for Macon. That means a lot to me, and wherever I go, I talk about Macon and, and its history. And not only do I love its history, but I, I want to talk about its future. So I've done a lot to try and sort of help make sure that Macon has that bright musical future that we're, you know, in the 70s and 80s, late 60s even, we were thought of as the home of Southern rock and a lot of R&B too. Uh, and, and we don't really have that place on the map anymore. And um, I mean, what that requires is a musical infrastructure. That's the only difference between Macon and LA, Macon and Nashville, Macon and New York, is they have a, a better infrastructure to support the art that's there. As far as talent goes, we can compete with all those places. So I'm working hard to try and make sure there's that infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean there are lots of venues that pay a decent wage. For, for working musicians, but also not only do they pay a decent wage, but they also advertise the fact that there's going to be music there. Posting on Facebook's not enough. That you've got to do more. You've got to you've got to create this idea that every Friday night you can go to so and so's place and hear great music. That's something you have to do. So it's this idea of creating that's creating a synergy of people that are into all the different aspects of, of art and entertainment, from journalists to recording studios to performance venues, rehearsal halls, um, all these different things we need to make our music communities you know, vibrant. And, and I want people to understand that you can have a great career. You don't have to move to Nashville. You don't have to move to Atlanta. With the technology of the internet, with FedEx, all these things, you can go to those places for the few times you have to, but by and large, you know, this is a, this is a great place to have a career. So that's what I'm really passionate about and what I'm really working on right now. But making means a lot. I mean, I love it, and it's it, it's embraced me. And I'm, I wouldn't I wouldn't live anywhere else. I mean, this is this is where I'm going to stay. Kim's actually a Mercer girl. She um, is in the medical library at Mercer. And her album is called Forget Me Not. And it's well worth checking out on iTunes or wherever you consume music. But um, I produced that record for her uh, this year, 2016. And it's really, it's really a great record. And, and it's, it was just a pleasure to work with her. Sleeping with the Past. It's a, it's a sad song about two people who um, just can't seem to, to be alone, so instead they choose to stay together. You know, we are the home of Otis Redding, and I think this is so great that, that Macon is now really showing 
you know, the artists that we have here today. So I couldn't be more excited and more happy to be a part of this CD. She kind of let me do whatever I wanted to do with the record. So whatever I said, she's like, oh yeah, that's great. So uh, that, I like that. that. That makes me happy. The first record I did was really tough. Um, it was called um, Take a Walk in the Shadows, and um, it was a tough record. I was 21-ish, and um, I was operating at a really high level, but I was an unknown quantity. I wasn't, you know, uh, I wasn't sort of, you know, musical royalty or anything here in town. I was new, and um, I was working at a very high level with a lot of high-level musicians and stuff like that and recording and things, but nobody really knew what no you know knew what to expect out of me and, and I had a very specific vision for that record and um, it was tough I mean you know people equate your songs to being like your children I think that's pretty fair um, I can call my child a jerk but you can't you know, you know I mean I think that's pretty fair I mean I think I could criticize my art but you can't you know that's kind of I think that's a pretty fair idea that, that that's kind of how we feel about it and um, when you've when you've lived through something that's really emotional and has a real connection to you spiritually and, and something that shaped who you are and you, and you talk about that experience in song, it's real difficult because you're being really honest and open and exposed. And uh, so you, 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 know, you feel kind of possessive. And so that first record was tough because a lot of people I was working with didn't believe in my vision. And I was like, well, you know, you, you can play it my way or you can go. <laughs> I mean, no, it's just like, you know, this is, this is it. This is how it's going to be, right or wrong, this is how it's going to be. And looking back, um, I definitely was a little bit too much controlling on that first record. I mean, I, I mean there's, not, there's nothing on that first record. I mean, absolutely nothing. I'm not, I'm not kidding when I say this. I mean, from every drum fill, every, every you know, percussion pattern, everything was by design. And um, if it wasn't perfect, I mean, we did it again and again and again and again. And um, I, I look back now, and that was that was too much. What what really you should do is surround yourself with talented people, have a vision, certainly be the captain of the ship, as it were, but allow them to do their job. So today I do that. I mean, I still produce and arrange everything, but I also have places where I allow other people to put their fingerprint on what I'm doing. Um, and, and it's a much happier process. But that first record was really tough. But, but also, a, as a blind teenager, um, that was a very difficult time for me because uh, I started wanting to date and, and get out in the world of, of, of that kind of thing. And um, as a blind person, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, um, you don't have a real understanding of what your competition's like. In other words, you know, I didn't really know how I compared to other guys my age. Was I... Was I, a, uh, was I a super stud or was I like a scary you know, wildebeest? I mean, what, how did I look? How, could I, how did I relate to my peers? That was, very, that was a very trying sort of thing to understand. Eventually what I under realized is that it's all in your head. And um, how you feel about you is how you are. And um, that's really, the minute that I understood that, uh, I, I had no trouble dating at all. Um, but it took me a while to kind of figure that out. So there was some pain. There was some, there was some difficulty there. Um, so... Um, that's it. Right now I'm working on a blues record, and it's called Blind Man Driving. Actually, it's Blind Man Driving, apostrophe. And, and there's actually a video out for it. I encourage you to go look it up. It's pretty funny. Uh, Bibb County Sheriff's Department gave us an officer in a car, and it appears as if I'm being chased around town by the police. Everything I have done, I felt like such a fool.
Music's important to me because it is the most perfect thing I know that allows me to experience the divine. And what I mean by that is I feel like music's a true heavenly language. It's a language, it has syntax, it has grammar, it has punctuation. And, and it's, it's just this universal thing that cuts through every barrier you can possibly think of. It, it can cut through language barriers, it can cut through race barriers, it can cut through any kind of barrier you put up. And it, it is abling, it, it, it enables you to, to really be free. I mean, music's something you can lose yourself in. It's something that can pick you up when you're feeling low. It's something that can bring a sense of unity. So music's important to me because I just think it's, I think it is one of the true great powers of this earth. I think it's one of the true, truly great wonders we have. And I just think that it's, it's such a beautiful thing because at the end of the day, you know, what's important is this idea of connecting with other people, to, to be able to have a dialogue and to, and to treasure these spirits that you encounter on earth. I mean, you know, I, I think that's just, I think the relationships are, is where it's at. I mean, I think knowing other people, being friends with other people, helping other people to grow, having them help you to grow, that's what it's all about. And music's so empowering and so powerful that it can do all that. It's a great medium for that kind of thing. So, I mean, it's the reason I get up in the morning. It really is. And, and I also uh, use music as a, as a tool of healing. Um, it sounds kind of weird, but I have a, again, I told you I had a brain tumor because I'm blind. I've got a metal hip in this side because I had something called a vascular necrosis, which meant that my hip bone literally just crumbled into dust. And uh, it was kind of a shock. I was in my late 20s and wasn't expecting that to happen. I ended up in a wheelchair for about six months. And the amount of pain I was in was staggering because my body, I'm one of those weird people who, I don't metabolize narcotics. So pain medicine doesn't really work for me. And I use music as my pain medicine. So what I would do every morning when I was hurting so bad from this pain, I would, I would turn on some piece of music that utterly enthralled me. And I would listen to it and my mind would focus on the magic, the intricacies of that piece of music. And once I got my mind shifted away from the pain and focused on the music, I was able to keep that pain at bay for the rest of the day. It sounds a little metaphysical, it sounds a little new age, it really, it really is not, but I mean, I mean it, it's, you know, part of me, I'm an artist and a spiritual person, but I'm also a scientist, because all this stuff behind you is very scientific and, and takes a good a scientific grasp of physics to work correctly. So when I say that it's, it's, it was truly a, a painkiller for me, I mean, I'm, I'm as serious as I know how to be. So that's why music's important to me. It, it is really one of the greatest forces for good that I know.